evening one and all present here i am mr dinesh the current chair of ieee power electronic society a student branch at new horizon college of engineering i welcome everyone here present uh, for the distinguished lecture seminar on model predictive control in power electronics a critical review and recent industrial products now i request dr vinod kumar k senior associate professor of uh, electrical electronics engineering new horizon college of engineering to address the participants and give the welcome speech uh, good evening uh, participants uh, uh, first of all i would like to welcome uh, the uh, today speaker dr tobias gear uh, is a distinguished uh, lecturer as well as uh, uh, the uh, professor uh, in stellbosch university as well as the engineer at abb medium voltage drives switzerland so uh, first of all i would like to welcome his uh, uh, seminar for to this seminar distinguished lecture program organized by the department of tripoli urism college of engineering and also i would like to welcome uh, the secretary of i tripoli power electronics uh, bangalore section uh, for this uh, distinguished lecture program and i would like to welcome the participants and uh, in academia industry as well as uh, research scholar and students who is working in this uh, power electronics domain so uh, actually uh, my our uh, head of the department uh, due to his uh, sudden commitment and uh, meeting uh, is not able to join to give a welcome speech so on behalf of him uh, i am giving us a welcome speech so this program is a distinguished lecture program which is organized by the department of tripoli university and college of engineering and uh, this lecture uh, which will talks about the model predictive control in power electronics domain a critical review and uh, recent industrial uh, products so in this lecture uh, the, uh, the speaker will be able to uh, first he will uh, explain the two industrial success stories and the commercial benefits and he is also going to explain about the state of art in predictive control and uh, point out the directions for future research thank you now i'd request naira the ieee pels vice chair of student branch chapter nhc to give uh, an introduction about the speaker uh, thank you nishal so i take immense pleasure in introducing our distinguished uh, guest speaker for the day uh, dr tobis gear received the diploma and phd degrees in electrical engineering from eth zurich Zurich Switzerland in 2000 and 2005 respectively and the habilitation degree in power electronics from ETH Zurich Zurich Switzerland in 2017 after his phd he spent 3 years at GE Global Research Munich Germany 3 years at the University of Auckland Auckland New Zealand and 8 years at ABB's corporate research center Baden Dattel Switzerland There, in 2016, he became a senior principal scientist for power conversion control. He was appointed as an extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch University, Stellenbosch, South Africa, from 2007 to 2023. In 2020, he joined AVP's medium voltage drives business as R&D platform manager at the ACS six triple zero slash six zero eight zero. He is the author of ABB Medium's Voltage Drives business as R&D platform manager. He is the author of the 35 patent families and the book Model Predictive Control of High Power Converters in Industrial Drives. He teaches a regular course on model predictive control at ETH Zurich. His research interests include medium voltage and low voltage drives. utility space power converters optimize pulse patterns and model predictive control dr gear is a recipient of the 2017 first place prize paper award in the transactions on power electronics with 2014 third place prize paper award in the transactions on industry applications and of the two prize pa paper award at conferences He is former associate editor for the transactions on industry applications from 2011 until 2014, and the transactions on power electronics from 2013 until 2019. He 
He was an international program committee vice chair of the IAFC conference on non-linear model predictive control in Madison, USA in 2018. Dr. Gear is a distinguished lecturer of the Power Electronic Society in the years 2020 and 2021. I welcome you, sir. I request all the participants uh, to stay on mute till 6.30 until the uh, lecture is over. And after the, le after the lecture is over, you can unmute yourself or put in your questions in the chat box, which will be, which will be answered. Thank you, sir. You may continue. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction. Thank you very much for, for organizing this event. Thanks in particular to Professor um, Kuma for, for hosting me and for having, for having arranged that. So today we want to talk about model predictive control and in particular give you a bit of a review what is out there, what sort of methods are commonly used and, and also show a little bit what is actually being applied in industry and where maybe a little bit more work is needed. So I will have an introduction. I want to start by looking into control and modulation and explain to you what sort of the classic way of doing things is. In, in power electronics, and then based on that, formulate a, a vision, what we would like to do in power conversion control and, and make the case and, and motivate the use of model predictive control. Then I want to talk about three control concepts. The first one is finite control set MPC. That's maybe what, what most of you would associate with, with model predictive control in power electronics, but this is just one method out of, out of a few. The second one is model predictive pulse pattern control, where we run fast controller based on, on programmed modulation on, on optimized pulse patterns. And the third one is model predictive control of load commutated inverters, where we coordinate the, the two sides of the drive system, the, the rectifier and the inverter. And then in the end, I want to give you a little bit of an assessment and, and conclusions. So let's start with um, the introduction and let's start by looking into control and modulation. And maybe the, the simplest possible example one could come up with in, in, in an AC um, setting is to have a converter. Let's assume it's a three level converter so I can switch between the zero a plus and a minus one. I have an RL load and some voltage source against which we operate. So that could be the grid, the, the voltage at the point of common coupling, or it could be a back EMF in an electrical machine. So single phase converter with an active RL load. And the, the objective would be to, to drive a sinusoidal current through the load and to effectively follow this given reference. So I will use the symbol star to indicate it's a reference and we want to create a current that follows it. Now, the way it's typically done is we would measure the current, we would compare it with the reference and we would feed the error into a controller, say a, a linear controller. And this controller would manipulate a, a reference converter voltage. So it's a star because it's a reference. And again, it would be sinusoidal, maybe have a slightly different magnitude and a slightly different phase. This is all in per unit. So it's normalized with respect to some base quantity. And uh, now the trouble is, or the control problem would be that we want to manipulate these inputs to our system so that we follow these references, but that we also have stability and that we reject disturbances and that we achieve a good performance. Now in power electronics, we have discrete switch positions. So we somehow find a way to um, map the sinusoidal voltage into switching commands. And one way of doing that is to add carriers. So we would compare this reference or modulating signal with triangular carriers. And because we have a three level converter, we would have an upper triangular carrier and a lower triangular carrier. And whenever these two signals intersect, 
let's assume we use natural sampling for the time being, whenever they intersect, we would switch. So when we, um, when the uh, modulating signal is lower than the carrier, lower than the upper carrier and larger than the lower carrier, then we would have a zero. And if the modulating signal exceeds all carriers, then we have a, a plus. So we would translate this um, um, reference signal or modulating signal into switching commands. Now, if we do that, then the current we get has this distinctive ripple. So we will get the switching ripple on top of the fundamental component. Now, with carrier-based pulse width modulation at the bottoms and the peaks of the triangular carrier, so if we sample the currents exactly at these instances in time, then we will more or less only sample the fundamental component. You notice the ripple component is zero at these sampling instances. And that's beautiful. It means that the switching behavior is hidden from the controller. The controller doesn't necessarily need to know that there is a switching power converter at all. The converter just assumes that from what he manipulates and what he receives is a linear system. So switching is, is hidden. And this concept of control and modulation and hiding the switching that directly extends to three phase system. So I could now also show you an equivalent three phase machine or a three phase electrical grid. So in summary, what is typically done is we have this inner current control problem. So we have a current controller and a modulator and we would hide the switching from the controller. So we would assume that we have zero current ripple at the sampling instances. And we would work in a rotating coordinate system. So we would have measurements of the three currents. We would translate them from ABC into a rotating coordinate system. Let's say it's called DQ. And in DQ, we would compare them with reference signals. We would have the controller maybe with some decoupling term and would produce these modulating signals in DQ. So that turns AC alternating current quantities into DC quantities, at least at steady state. So that makes it very easy for the controller because it, it has a, an error that can be controlled to zero. It doesn't need to follow um, references. So the current controller is often a, a field oriented controller on the machine side or a voltage oriented controller on the grid side. One could use proportional integral controllers as current controller, or one could go for deadbeat control. Deadbeat means one says I have a certain I have a certain sampling interval. So I'm here, I have the sampling instances, and I have the next sampling instance here. And I have a certain, let's say a certain current error. And at the next time step, I would want this current error to be zero. So I can ask myself um, what sort of voltage I should apply now in this interval. So that after this one time step, my predicted current error is going to be zero. So this is almost a, a model inversion. It's that beat control. Some people call it predictive because you make a, a prediction step from here to here. But in the end, it's you, know, you ask yourself, what sort of voltage do I need to apply in this interval to make the predicted current error zero? So this is that beat control. And the modulator, we can use classic modulation, carrier-based pulse modulation, space vector modulation, and so on. Or, and that's what I'm more interested in, the so-called programmed modulation. That means you compute offline a set of switching angles and switching patterns, either by um, minimizing an objective function, then we have optimized pulse patterns, or by setting a certain number of low frequency harmonic amplitudes to zero, then we would have selective harmonic elimination. Or one can combine both the, the current controller and, and the modulator and do it in one shot. That would be direct torque control, for example, or direct power control on the grid side. So what we 
try to do in power conversion control is to, to develop control methods that best use the hardware that we have. So we want to make best use of the hardware capability of our power electronic system. And the focus is here on system. We don't just care about the converter or the machine or a certain filter. We want to make the whole system as performant as possible. So what does that mean? Um, one aspect is we would like to minimize the harmonic distortions. So that means we want to achieve load friendly operation. So this means that we would like to reduce the harmonic current distortion. So TDD is the total demand distortion. So that's similar to total harmonic distortion. So by achieving that, we, we achieve a load friendly operation. We reduce the, the harmonic losses in the load. On the other hand, we would like to minimize the switching effort. So that can be the switching frequency or the switching losses. So we'd like to switch with as little as low losses as possible. So that makes the operation suitable for the converter. So this is converter friendly operation. And you see in power electronics, we have this trade off. So this is with carrier based pulse width modulation, different simulations, each point, and they can be approximated by this hyperbolic curve. So that means that the product between harmonic current distortions and switching frequency is more or less constant. And this constant depends on the way you modulate. It depends on the type of modulator used. So this constant is a performance metric, which we would like to make as small as possible. So we would like to find trade-off curves that are closer to the orange. That means we can either then bring down the harmonic current distortions for the same switching frequency, or we can bring down the switching frequency for the same harmonic distortions or both at the same time. So that's what I would call optimization. Often people say, yeah, I need to find here a nice trade-off point. So they trade in harmonic distortions for switching frequency and vice versa. So for example, they would reduce the harmonic distortions by pushing up the switching frequency. But that's not optimization. That's more like finding a trade-off point. So this metric here is important and we can use it as a metric here on the y-axis for the, the current distortions per switching frequency. Another important metric I would say is the dynamic performance. So the controller bandwidth. So how quickly can your controller react? How quickly can it reject disturbances? Think of a strong DC link voltage ripple. So your DC link, for example, is, is, is not a constant voltage, but has the strong ripple on top of it. So if you want to avoid that, you see this ripple in your currents, you need to account for it. So you need to have very, very fast disturbance rejection because that's a high frequency ripple. Think of six times the, the grid frequency. And you want to be able to react quickly to, to any demanded steps in the reference changes or so power steps or torque steps, for example. Now with direct torque control or direct power control, the controller is really fast. It has a very high dynamic bandwidth, but the harmonic current distortions per switching frequency are relatively high. So they're not that good. Field oriented control or voltage oriented control with classic modulation is maybe a little bit slow. In some cases, it might also have slightly less harmonic distortions. In other cases, it might even have more. At the other end of the extreme, you have a very slow control, volts per frequency or scalar control in contrast to vector control, where you control optimized pulse patterns. <clears throat> and the reason people use the slow control is because often it's difficult to control OPPs. We, I will talk about that in, in maybe 20, 20 to 25 minutes. What we really would like to achieve is to combine both worlds. So to combine this, this world of being really, really fast with this world of being having superior harmonic performance at low switching frequencies at um, using optimized pulse patterns. And then there's a third aspect, and that is to ensure 
that we stay within the safe operating limits of our converter. So we want to absolutely avoid that currents or voltages become overly large and that we then have a trip or even damage our converter. So by ensuring that we stay within these safe operating limits, we can ensure that the converter operates even under large disturbances and maybe even falls. So this gives us a high availability. This is re related to reliability, this topic. And as you can imagine, to address these um, three points, so to, 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 to optimize this trade-off, dynamic performance and operation, we need model predictive control. In NPC, what we do is we, we take a mathematical model of our system and we predict the future of evolution over a certain horizon, the prediction horizon, and choosing the best control input by solving a, an optimization problem. And then the next step, we take new measurements and we replan over a, a shifted or a receding horizon. If we look at the first ingredient, this model, um, we have this internal model. It could look, for example, like this. So we have states and inputs, the time step K. So we work with, with a discrete time axis. And given the states and inputs at time step K, we can predict, we can anticipate what the states will be at the next time step, K plus one. And we can do the same with the outputs. So given the, the states at the next time step, we can then predict what the outputs are going to be. So this you can do a time step K or time step K plus one. So here the model is nonlinear, but you can also obviously have a state space system with matrices A and B. So this internal model makes the controller smart. And it allows it to look into the future. So given a certain um, reference we would like to track and a certain tentative sequence of control inputs of manipulated variables, we can then predict how our outputs and our states will change over this prediction horizon, in this case of six or seven steps. The second key ingredient are constraints. So we can impose limits on states, on inputs and on output variables. So for example, we could impose an upper bound on the maximum current that we can tolerate. And we could enforce that our phase currents or converter currents stay below that limit. So this could be sort of the limit we impose. And then up here, we could have a trip limit and then somewhere here we would start damaging our converter. And the important bit is these constraints, they are included when designing the control. They're not imposed a posteriori afterwards in, in, an, in an additional loop. They are included right in the design, in the synthesis of the controller. Then we have a cost function. So the cost function cap captures what we want to achieve captures our control objectives. So think of, for example, a deviation of a state variable from its reference. That can be a scalar or that can be a vector. So the larger the error, the larger the penalty. So we would, for example, go here for a quadratic penalty. So that's why we use either two norm and we square it. So that could be um, alpha, it could be the first component minus x squared plus the second one and so on. So that's a nice, um, I mean, the two norm is, is, is a nice metric because small deviations are not penalized much, but very large deviations are penalized excessively. So we really enforce, or we really try to motivate, incentivize the controller to to, to have small tracking errors, but the very small tracking errors we don't care much about. So the cost function is effectively the, does the controller design and the tuning for us. And one example of a cost function would be that we look at the errors, the predicted errors of the current. So that's the predicted current and that's the reference current at future time steps over a horizon n. We use this square two norm and we penalize the predicted sums of these errors. And we also impose a penalty on switching. We'll talk about that in a moment. 
then we end up with a numerical optimization problem. So we put everything together, we get an optimization problem. And this one we have to solve numerically. We can't solve it algebraically. So we have to um, iteratively solve it. So here you see, for example, the cost function. So each point here in this two dimensional space would have the same cost. And we would like to find a set of manipulated variables over the horizon that minimizes the cost. So we want to get as closely as possible to this theoretical minimum. So we would start, for example, somewhere here, and then we would do these steps and, and, and minimize the, the value of the cost function until we hit here this constraint. The constraints, they result from um, upper and lower bounds and input states and, and, and so on. And they also result from maybe constraints on the outputs. So this would be the optimal solution, but this one we have to solve or find numerically. And then we have receding horizon policy. So we have computed this um, sequence of, of control inputs over the horizon in, but we're not going to apply the whole sequence. We will only apply the very first step. And then at the next, next time step, at the next time step K plus one, we will take new measurements and we will solve again the optimization problem, but over a shifted horizon. So the horizon shifts in from here to here. And you might ask yourself, isn't that a bit strange? I mean, you do all these computations, but you effectively throw them away and you just uh, apply the first element. Well, if you, you don't want to apply the whole sequence, just imagine that you have a big disturbance here, in the first time interval, then you would have to wait till this point before you can um, react to it. But in this case here, with the receding horizon policy, with this big disturbance here, you can react already here because you will measure the impact on the state variables this disturbance has incurred. The second thing is why do you use a horizon if you only apply the first step? Well, you need to have a good plan. I mean, you need to look several steps forward to come up with a better plan, how you bring the states and your outputs closer to, to the references, but you only apply the first element. So this is a little bit like playing chess, if you want. So you would also maybe look two or three steps ahead, how you would act. You would have some assumptions what your opponent would do, but you will revise your plan as needed. You would only implement the first move, and then you would, wait what your opponent does, and then you would maybe adjust your plan. But if you always just look one step ahead, you might not, not be able to win the game. So this receding horizon policy, this, this gives you feedback. The important bit is feedback. You don't just apply it open loop, you apply one element and then you get feedback. You see how your system reacts. So this feedback is critical. It's closed loop control because that gives you robustness. So if you're the model, the internal model you use here is not perfect, you can compensate for these, these imperfections. So robustness to parameter uncertainties. So this is the basic concept of model predictive control, but to make it applicable to, to power electronic systems, we need to tailor it. We need to tailor MPC to the problem at hand. One feature of power electronics converters is that the sampling interval is very short. It's typically just a couple of microseconds. So we don't have much time to solve the optimization problem. So we have to come up with formulations that can be solved quickly. And we need to spend quite a bit of time to reformulate these optimization problems so that we can solve them quickly. Then the inputs to our system are the converter switch positions. So those are integer variables. They're not real values. I mean, they're not 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5. They're zero, one, or maybe one, a minus one. And we can compute offline optimal switching patterns. So these are optimized pulse patterns. So then maybe it's a good idea to also use them in the controller to use that information. 
So the goal here is to combine control and modulation in one computational stage. So rather than having a controller and a modulator, two separate entities, we would combine them in one. And the advantage of doing so is that we avoid the delay. There's a delay between the controller and the modulator, typically because when you change your reference here and you change your reference at this point here, your modulator will only switch sort of with, with half of that half carrier interval delay. So, so this delay here, you can avoid by combining control and modulation in one stage. And you say, yeah, I mean, it's such a small delay, I don't need to care. Well, it limits your bandwidth. You will always have to care, even at very high switching frequencies, the short delay really hurts you, at least from my experience. And the second element is we would like to consider the switching characteristic in the controller. We would want the controller to know that the switch positions here, which it can apply, are integer variables. They're not, this, not um, real valid. So there are four methods, direct model predictive control. The, the first one is finite control set MPC, very versatile, highly popular in academia. We will spend now quite a bit of time talking about it in a moment. Then there's this MP3C, model predictive pulse pattern control. That's actually used in industry. It's based on, on optimized pulse patterns. We will talk about it. Then there is an improvement on direct torque control called model predictive direct torque or model predictive direct current and so on control. So that could be here torque or current or power. Hey. We don't have time to cover this. And then there's this coordinated control of load commutated inverter drives. So it's a nonlinear model predictive control with constraints. So we will also talk about that towards the end of this seminar. With this, I would like to jump into the main part to look into the three control concepts, starting with finite control set MPC. And because I work for a medium voltage drives company. I'm traditionally more interested in medium voltage drives. I will use medium voltage drives examples, but the same applies also to low voltage drives and to low voltage converters in general. So this is just an example. So let's look into the three level neutral point clamped inverter. Neutral point clamp means is that the neutral point here, this N is clamped by these diodes. And in each phase, phase A, B, and C, we can produce then a, a plus one switch position, a zero switch position, and a minus one switch position. DC link voltage shields in the range of five kilovolt. The machine would have a line to line RMS voltage of 3.3 kilovolt, maybe two MVA, typically for 50 hertz. And the goal would be to make its state of currents IS, S stands for state of follow a reference indicated by that star. And we manipulate these switch positions in the phases A, B, and C. So that would be these switch positions. So in phase A, in phase B, and in, in phase C. So I would call this UA, this UB, and this UC. And importantly, uh, we don't want to switch excessively. We are always interested in finding a good trade off between yeah, harmonic performance and and switching effort. So the cost function we would pick is relatively obvious. I mean, we want to, we want our stator currents. So I could maybe add here a little stator. We want our stator current to follow the references. And we would always um, impose that at the next time step over a horizon of maybe five, 10, maybe 20 time steps. So this is the tracking error. And then we have this penalty on switching. So whenever we change the, the three phase switch position, so A, B, and C, then this change is, is non-zero. So this is a vector. And whenever there's a non-zero change, we will have a switching event. So we can have this, this penalty here on, on switching to discourage us from switching excessively. So this penalty here would be a, a, positive, a, a positive real value quantity. 
Now the system model of the drive in the inverter, I, I assume it's, it's linear. So I, I write it down as a state space representation. The states can be any, any quantity that is associated with some, some storage. It can be a current or flux or voltage in a capacitor. The manipulated variable are these switch positions. So Z is an, an integer. So in this case, yeah, you have it written down here. It would be minus one, zero and one. And because you have three phases, I, I use the symbol three. Importantly, we don't switch. We want to switch from one to minus one. So in a neutral point clamp converter, you don't want to switch from the upper rail to the lower rail in one go because you might imbalance the voltages over the inner switches. And that might destroy it. Now, we need to minimize this cost function subject to the evolution of our system model and these constraints. So we can formulate an optimization problem. The way that is typically done is that we just try out all the possible solutions. So we would put in here all the possible combinations of switch positions. We would compute the states after one time step. We would maybe set n equal to one. And then we would evaluate the cost function for each of these voltage vectors. And for a three level. And for, I got scared. I thought my kids arrived, <laughs> but they're a little bit older. So I, um, so we would apply these voltage vectors. And for three level converter, we would have a, we would have 27 different combinations. So three per phase and three phases. So that's three to the power three, that's 27. So compute the states after one time step, put them into your cost function, get 27 different values for your cost function. And you pick the one that has the smallest cost. Now this works reasonably well when you are at time step K here. Here is um, the, the alpha component, the beta component. So we typically work in a stationary orthogonal coordinate system rather than in the classic ABC three phase frame. So if we just look one step ahead from time step K to K plus one, we have 19 different currents at the next time step from the 27 different combinations. And then we would evaluate the cost and we would pick the switch, switching combination with the minimum cost. So people say enumeration is easy. Enumeration is considered something easy because it's very easy to implement. Well, if you have a horizon of two steps, you have already more than 700 combinations you would have to try out. Well, it's not that easy anymore. And if you have three steps, you have 20,000. So you have here this combinatorial explosion because you have 27 to the power of the length of the prediction horizon combinations. So if you put here um, um, 40, then you have already a number like 10 to the power of 80, an incredibly large number. 10 to the power of 80 is actually the number of atoms in the observable universe. So that's what we can see. So that's an incredibly high, high number. And, and the horizon of 40 is maybe, yeah, it's long, but it's not excessively long. So enumeration, exhaustive enumeration is a non-starter. Now you can say, I agree, okay, I need to stay close to my reference. So there, there are a lot of combinations I can cut away. Yes, maybe you can cut away a nine out of 10, but you would have to cut away, not nine out of 10, but 99.99%. You have to pretty much cut away all. And to do that without impacting optimality of your solution is hard. And, and I want to show you a method how to achieve that in a, in a fairly elegant way. And that's here. So if you apply a little bit of your tricks to your cost function, to your optimization problem, you end up with this 
formulation here. It's an optimization problem. So we're trying to minimize um, this term. That's our cost function. We optimize over the switching sequence or the sequence of manipulated variables. So these are the switch positions in phase A, B, and C over the horizon in time step K till the end of the horizon. So this is an integer valued vector of the dimension three times the length of the prediction horizon. This is U. And then we have this U unconstrained here. So that's effectively what you would apply if you had a modulator. So if you had a modulator, that's sort of the modulating signal your controller would provide to the modulator. So it's real valued. It depends on the current state, the previously applied switching and the references of your quantities you want to track. And the interesting bit here is that we minimize the distance between these two vectors, but we do that in a very special space, in a space called, in a space spanned by the so-called generator matrix, V. And V is the Koleski decomposition of the so-called Hessian matrix of the integer quadratic program. So think of that like an, almost like a square root. So we work in a, in a non-trivial space. And in this non-trivial space, we find the minimum distance, Euclidean distance. So, so it's a square two norm. We are still only interest, interested in integer uh, vectors and we need to meet these switching constraints. So no switching between plus one and minus one. If you have a two level converter, then you can remove this. And so it looks like a very innocent, a very compact, small optimization problem. So let's just look at phase A and B. Let's assume there is no phase C. We, we still have a three level converter. Let's assume we have horizon one. So we have this dimension two. So this one here would be switch position in phase A and that would be switch position in phase B. So phase A can be minus one and phase B can be minus one. Phase A can be zero, phase B can be minus one and so on. So we have these nine different combinations. Now we have this V matrix, this generator matrix and this matrix transforms this original space into something with a different distance between these integer points and it distorts them. So they are no longer orthogonal. So, but we have here now a bit less than 90 degrees. So, so it's, it's almost like a crystal, but it's not orthogonal anymore. So here we clearly have 90 degrees. Here it's sort of distorted. And we call this a lattice. Hmm? Hey, and it's a truncated, a finite lattice because we have finite number of, of um, levels in our converter. In this case, we have only three. So this is a truncated lattice. And in this new space, we want to minimize the distance between this unconstrained solution and any of those integer points. So let's assume you have a good idea what a, a reasonable starting point is. That could be that integer solution. That means it's switch position one and minus one. So that, that's this one here, the, the one and the minus one in this V space. And we want to minimize this distance. So that means any point that's further away, you can disregard because it's, it's, it's worse than the solution you have already. So you compute the radius, you compute the distance, and this defines a sphere, a ball, a hyperball that is centered at this unconstrained solution. So this is really a ball in two dimensions, it's, it's just a circle. So any solution that is outside of it is clearly worse and you're not interested in it. So you can discard it, you can neglect it without impacting optimality. You're only looking for integer points within the ball because they might have a closer, a, a smaller distance and one of them is actually the optimal solution. So we only look at integer points within the sphere. So this is called um, the sphere decoder. Maybe it's modified because we, we have the switching constraints. 
So this is indeed a, a branch and bound method. We have branching. So we branch over the single set, single phase switch positions that meet the switching constraint. So that means if we have a horizon two and we have three phases and we start here with the root node, we haven't done anything. And now we ask ourselves, should we switch um, to the switch position minus one in phase A? So this would be time step k glide equal to one phase A. And then comes this bounding into play. So we put this into our cost function. And in this case, it would exceed our preliminary radius we have. So this solution is already outside of the sphere. This solution would be outside of that sphere. So then we know that if this initial point is already outside, any other point that comes later is also outside. So then we can disregard it. So let's switch maybe to a zero, time step one in phase A. And then we are, let's assume we are inside of the sphere. So we walk down. Then in time step one, phase B, let's pick the minus one, we are outside, we disregard it, we pick the zero, we are inside, and so on. And then after six steps, we have found already a good sequence of manipulated variables. That means we would switch to zero, zero, minus one at time step k. So those are these three, and then to zero, zero, zero at the next time step. Now we need to see what happens here. I mean, we go backwards, they are all outside of the bounds. There's some choice here we need to explore a little bit. And here we come up with another solution and we would have, we would pick the one with the smaller cost. So this allows us to very quickly find the optimal solution with a proof with a certificate that this is indeed the optimal solution. We're not making any assumptions. We're not cutting anything away that we should not cut away. We only cut things away where we have a proof that the optimal solution is not attached down here. So this is branch and bound method. And that works beautifully. It takes very, very little time to solve the optimization problem. I unfortunately don't, don't have the slide here. So let's look at the performance. So if you have space vector modulation and we operate here at, at nominal frequency, let's say 50 Hertz rated torque. So this is falling per unit, 250 Hertz switching frequency. You see here how phase A, B and C switch at 250 Hertz. And you see that the current ripple is relatively large and the harmonic distortions of the state of current is also large. So this is space vector modulation, but you don't really see the sidebands around the carrier because of these low switching frequencies, it starts to all get overlapped. If we use an optimized pulse pattern, we have the same switching frequency. So you see that you just change the time when you switch, but the switching frequency is the same, but the THD is 40% less. So you have a significantly lower current ripple. Now this also holds at, at, at much higher switching frequencies. So if you go to a kilohertz or two kilohertz, three kilohertz, you can still compute these OPPs and you still get a nice improvement. It's not going to be 40%, it's maybe in the range of 15 to 20%, but it's still there. Now, if you go for this horizon one, then we get some on the current distortions of, of 6%. So if you compare that to the 8% or the, and to the 4%, we are right in the middle at um, 6%. And if you go to a long horizon or longish horizon of 10 steps, you have 5%. You, you sort of get an improvement of, yeah, maybe 20% by using this long horizon. Nice, but not outstanding. What you also notice is that the harmonic spectrum of the currents is very different. It's sort of flat. I mean, you sort of have a flat spectrum. It almost looks a bit like white noise. There are some distinctive harmonics that come out. That would be here an 11th harmonic. And that would be here 
I guess, a ninth harmonic. So we are here at 50 hertz fundamental, but overall it is fairly an, an erratic spectrum. And that is because your switching pattern is non-repetitive and non-symmetric. So if you look at what happens in phase A and what then happens in phase B, they're not the same. And there's also no symmetry between the first half and the second half. Now, what you will notice is one bit of a disadvantage here. They're not equally loaded. So you have here a lot of switching, and then you have very little switching here. That's not good. I mean, you want to equally load both halves of your converter in terms of switching, switching losses and switching effort. Now, if you go for this longer horizon, you see it's becoming a little bit like, like a classic pulse width modulation. So the harmonic spectrum is much cleaner. You can now see nice discrete harmonics. And you start seeing some symmetry, some repetitiveness in your switching pattern. It is less erratic than it was up here. Still a bit of a way to go when you compare it with the optimized pulse pattern, but it's definitely better than space vector modulation. And that was at least to me a bit of a surprise that even the short horizon at these low switching frequencies outperforms um, space vector modulation. Now, little example, I want to show you this the same machine, but now with a horizon of 40. What you see here is an animation. So we have the time axis. I use a sampling interval of 25 microseconds. So anything here to the left is the past. These are the predictions. That's my horizon. So my horizon is 40, 40 times 25 is a millisecond. That's what you see here. You see here the current reference in alpha and then beta, I believe. The dotted line is the reference and the dash dotted line are, are the predictions. And, and you see that we track it, but we allow quite a big current ripple. And the reason is that we don't want to switch too much. So you see here the switching in phase A and phase B and phase C. And here to the right, you see the, you see the predictions. And up here, you have the torque. So the torque is meant to stay around one per unit. So what you nicely see is that it sort of moves through. You can nicely see this receding horizon policy. Every now and then, we get a discrete change in the switching. That is simply because, yeah, it's, it's a non-linear problem. It, it, at some point, it, it becomes, yeah, it's, at some point it makes sense to add a switching transition to, to reduce the, the current ripple. So that's because it's discrete or, or an integer problem. And let me remind you that um, with this horizon 40 and three phases, you have 10 to the power of 80. So as many atoms in the observable universe. And so, so many solutions you have. And this sphere decoder converges with infections yeah, within around 50, you know, more like 25, 30 microseconds, it, it, it finds the optimal solution with a certificate of, of optimality. Torque steps. So we have an induction machine. Let's assume that torque changes from one per unit to zero and back to one. You see the, here the currents, how they are adjusted. We have an induction machine, an asynchronous machine, and hence the machine needs to be magnetized. We have here the magnetizing current, so the currents can't be zero. At zero torque, we still need magnetizing current. And you see here the switch positions. And we are here at high speed or rated speed. So it's very easy for the converter to reduce the torque very quickly. So all we need to do is we have the state of flux, we have the rotor flux, we have rotation in that direction. This is high torque, and if you want to get zero torque, we can just apply a zero vector and wait till the rotor flux catches us, or we can actively bring it down towards the rotor flux. And that's what's happening here. We apply a 
a voltage vector in that direction. So we invert the voltage we apply to the converter. At this point here, we have state of flux and rotor flux, and we need to move the state of flux vector ahead, but we also rotate in that direction. So the rotor flux also moves ahead. So we need a very long vector, which doesn't exist. We are limited in terms of voltage, and hence it is slow. So that has nothing to do with the controller, that is physics. Now, if you go from horizon one to horizon 10, you don't see a difference. I mean, <laughs> it, it's not copy and paste, but I could have copy and pasted it. So long horizons do not impact, they do not slow down your dynamic response. The dynamic response is the same regardless of the length of the horizon. The dynamical performance here is only limited by the voltage of your converter that is available. Now, things get much more interesting when you have a more complicated system. So let's now add here an LC filter between the converter and the machine. And let's take some typical values for a medium voltage converter. So if you do that, then you get a resonance. So if you have here the voltage, which you apply and you look here at the current you get, then you will get a, a transfer function. So let's say this is the frequency and this is your sort of the gain. That might look like this. So you have this relatively sharp resonance. So whenever you do switching here, you will excite that, that LCL structure. So here you have this L sigma, the leakage inductance. So this, this capacitance oscillates against these two inductors and defines the frequency of this resonance, which is in this case at 300, and 300 hertz. So if you have a, a short prediction horizon, so just looking one step ahead and you look at the harmonic current distortions versus switching frequency of each device, then you see it's bad. I mean, it really works, works relatively badly. So I don't have any active damping loop outside. I just use that um, predictive current controller and I control all three quantities. So I control the inverter current, the capacitor voltage and the, the stator current. If I go for horizon of five, I'm already much closer to the origin. So I have an improvement of yeah, factor of four or five here. Hmm? So much lower harmonic distortions at lower switching frequencies. And if I go for the long horizon of 20, it's even better. Now what's interesting here, and these are simulation results, they're fairly accurate, but they're not experimental results, but they indicate that you could operate your converter at a switching frequency that is similar or even below the resonance of your system. So the resonance is at 300 Hertz. That means we would usually say the converter should operate at three times the switching frequency. So it should operate at least with a kilohertz. Now that's three level converter. That means each device should operate at least with 500 Hertz. Now with this, um, direct model predictive control. You see here quite a few simulations where we operate with around 150 Hertz. And that gives us an apparent switching frequency of the converter of 300 Hertz. So that's exactly where the resonance is. So this indicates that we can go from this recommended, yeah, 300 to 350 Hertz to something like 150 Hertz. So this is a huge reduction by a factor of three, which with a classic controller, I don't think is possible because we would always say it has to be three times the resonance. Now I, I've learned only very, um, just a few minutes ago that I have a bit more time to talk. So I thought I should give you 
a bit more insight into this finite control set MPC because it's probably the method most of you will be working with. So I thought I should give you yeah, a few guidelines, a few fairly hands on proposals. So they are from this recent paper cited down here. So the first one is the norm. So if you were to design such a finite control set MPC controller, what sort of a norm should you use? So in your cost function, should you use the one norm or should you use the square two norm? The one norm means that you will take this error minus, and you will just take the absolute value. You do that in the alpha component and you do the same in the beta component, I S beta. So just the one norm. And the square two norm means you do the same, but you square them. And you might say, yeah, the one norm is easier to compute. It's the same, I go for that one. It's a really bad idea. <laughs> and you see it here for, for a two level converter, you see the harmonic current distortions and the switching frequency. If you have a very high switching frequency, it doesn't really matter. If you then reduce the switching frequency, and you use the first choice, this, this one norm here, you see that your harmonic distortions really go up and then you end up with this point. So here, I'm not able to operate at the lower switching frequency. And the reason is shown here. At these points here, what happens is that you temporarily lose control. So you would like to track this reference, but your phase current starts deviating and you're not doing anything about it because the cost function is an ill it's an ill-conceived cost function. Do not use the one norm. It leads to instability. And for details, have a look at the paper. If you want, I can also try to later explain it to you. With the two norm, you don't have that issue. With the two norm, you can gracefully reduce the switching frequency and the harmonic distortions gracefully neatly go up. You have this hyperbolic trade-off curve. Remember that I THD times switching frequency is more or less equal to a constant. So this applies here when you use the two norm. So you can nicely tune your penalty on switching to get the desired switching frequency. Now in general, at least control people, they are really interested, some might say obsessed with stability proofs. Proving stability here is really hard. I mean, Ricardo Aguilera did that during his PhD. You can try to prove practical stability. So you can't prove that your currents and voltages converge to zero, your error, because you are always going to switch. So you always have a current ripple. You can only sort of try to prove that they're bounded so that they stay within a certain range. And that's called practical stability. It's much easier to show or uh, to give examples, counter examples. And that's for example, this, this one norm here where you can clearly show that you get instability when you try to operate here. Finding counter examples is always easier than proving that such counter examples are not possible. Now, another topic is the penalty on the switching effort. So you might ask yourself, do I really have to penalize switching? I don't care about switching. I have IGPTs, I have MOSFETs. I can just switch as much as I want. I don't care. Well, if you do that and you pick lambda u equal to zero, you get this deadbeat behavior, which I briefly tried to explain to you earlier on. You say, okay, deadbeat doesn't sound too bad. So let me show you here some numerical examples for two level converter. We have space factor modulation. It's a certain carrier um, frequency that gives you a switching frequency of 2.3 kilohertz and the THD of 6%. Now I go for this finite control set MPC, use horizon one, no penalty on switching. And I tune my sampling interval such that I get 2.3 kilohertz. So in this case, I need 50 uh, microseconds. I get 6%, the same current THD. If I now use a horizon of 10, I 
get exactly the same current distortions. So this long horizon has no impact. It, it doesn't improve things. And I think that's part of the reason why people in the beginning said long horizons don't help. I don't see an improvement. I suspect, and having talked to a few people, they always set the penalty on switching to zero. Now, the same happens here when I go to higher switching frequencies. And the reason why nothing changes can be seen down here. So again, you have current THD switching frequency. You have the blue curve is a trade-off curve for horizon one, horizon three, five, and 10. And here, these low switching frequencies, you see a nice, nice improvement of the horizon 10 versus horizon one, bring um, this THD down. Now, if I go to higher switching frequencies, I make lambda smaller. So here, lambda u is large. And here, lambda u is equal to 0. So I need to make it smaller. And then my switching frequency goes up. At this point, it's 0. And it doesn't matter anymore how long a horizon I have. They all give me the same result. They all give me exactly the same switching. So don't tune your switching frequency by manipulating the sampling interval. That's a bad idea. Always penalize the switching transitions. And then you will get the benefit of long horizons. And you will also get a lower THD. I mean, you will have remembered that you would expect maybe 5% here instead of 6%. So when should you use long horizons? I mean, if you have just a simple two-level converter with an induction machine, you compare your space vector modulation with horizon 1, horizon 10, the difference is really small. Maybe it's not worth the effort. But if you have an LC filter in between, so if you have a system that is a third order system, there the difference is huge. It makes a huge difference. So then using a long horizon really, really helps. And you can significantly bring down either switching frequency or THD or both. So related to this point here about the penalty on switching is the sampling frequency. So sometimes people limit the switching frequency by using a low sampling frequency. And I'm trying to show that here to you. So we switch here always with the same switching frequency. That's um, four kilohertz, two level converter, horizon one. Space vector modulation gives you this 1.7%. And now I reduce my sampling interval, from 35 down to 0 0.25 microseconds. And I tune the penalty on switching accordingly so that I always have the same switching frequency. And you can see how the current distortions are being reduced. So they go from 2 to 1.8, 1.6, up to maybe where the ratio between sampling frequency and switching frequency is 100 or more. Then you get an incremental, you get very small improvements. So I would say if, if you switch at least, if, if you sample at least 100 times more often than you switch, then you're fine. But if you switch, I mean, but, but, but if your sampling frequency is just 10 times the switching frequency, like shown down here, or five times, then the THD will be rather poor. And the reason simply is your controller needs enough degrees of freedom. You don't want to artificially restrict your time axis. So here, the controller has to either switch here or here or here. But maybe it would like to switch here and it would like to switch there. It can't. It has to make a compromise. Don't enforce this compromise. Give it a very fine, finely sampled time axis so that your controller can switch more or less at any instant in time. And then you get these very favorable um, current distortions. So. Don't control the switching frequency by setting a low sampling frequency. Pick as high a sampling frequency 
as possible. Make it at least 100 times the switching frequency and then adjust the switching frequency by using this penalty on switching lambda u. Now you might say, look, I, I cannot sample at 100 kilohertz or it's at a megahertz or 10 megahertz. Then maybe one needs to develop another control method. Hmm. Or at least be aware of the compromise and the limitation you have here. Good, then you can try to avoid tuning. Um, yeah, there's a lot of discussion about tuning and that you would want to avoid tuning by using some heuristics, I would say. There are also analytical methods that tell you what the penalty should be. For example, you want to control the torque and the state of flux magnitude of a machine. Well, you have, you can translate everything into state of flux. I mean, you can translate the cost function level sets into a state of flux related level sets. And then you could say a current controller would have circular level sets. And a current controller minimizes, minimizes the harmonic current distortions. So let's assume your torque and flux magnitude controller should have as low a THD as possible. So that means you need to get circular level sets. And you can compute how you should set the weight so that you get as circular level sets as possible. There's no, no need for anything else. Now you still have the switching frequency you need to adjust. You have this lambda u, but here there are tricks. I mean, you can avoid the tuning and then uh, by adding a state, by, by tracking the switching frequency in your cost function, for example. So then again, no tuning. So in summary, this finite control set MPC, it's simple. You can use it for almost any control problem. It achieves very fast dynamic response and it works. I would say I would use it. It works really well for complicated systems. Systems where you have these LC filters, systems where you have strong saliency in machines, where the D and the Q axis have very different impedances. So there it works, it works really nicely. Now, if you use this sphere decoding and just just one second, and then we can have a question. If if you use that sphere decoding, you're restricted to, to linear systems with integer inputs. You need a high sampling frequency. You get a non-deterministic harmonic spectrum. So you get this harmonic spectrum where you have even order harmonics, harmonics that are an even integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. And you see here, when you look at the IEEE 519 grid code, for example, the even order harmonics are much more strongly limited or penalized than the odd numbered harmonics. So this is a problem. So I think more work is needed to make finite control set MPC suitable for grid connected converters. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that the way it is now we can nicely apply it for grid connected converters simply because there are fairly stringent grid standards that we need to meet. If you use a classic modulator, then you would choose your, your switching frequencies so that you fall behind um, below these bands. So an OPP, we compute by saying, I have a certain voltage amplitude I would like to achieve, a certain fundamental voltage component that could be here a sinusoidal um, voltage. Think of this as, as the modulating signal. And that's effectively the modulation index. So here we would have modulation index of 0 0.95. And we also need to define the switching frequency we would like to operate at. And that defines the number of switching angles we have. So with a three level converter, neutral point clamp converter, three switching transitions of the first 90 degrees, corresponds to three times the fundamental frequency as switching frequency. So that would be switching frequency would be three times the fundamental frequency. So if the sinusoidal waveform is at 50 Hertz, we would be switching each device at 150 Hertz. And what we do is we impose usually 
quarter and half phase symmetry. So whatever we do in the first 90 degrees, we mirror and we repeat. And whatever we do in the first 180 degrees, we mirror at this point. So this point here and this point here, that's the same, just that we switch down here where we switched up. So we can compute the harmonic voltage spectrum this pulse pattern will produce. We can assume we have an inductive load. So we can compute the amplitudes of the current harmonics. We say we want to minimize the current THD. So we then have an analytic expression for the current THD. We can remove parameters, and then we end up with this cost function here. So this cost function is effectively proportional to the current THD squared. So if you minimize this cost function, then we minimize the current THD. And this cost function is an, anal is an analytical expression of the switching angles, these alphas, these ones here. And this is the variable over which I will optimize. We have the switching transitions. That means I switch up, switch down, switch up. So these delta UIs are plus or minus one. And N is the harmonic order. We have this equality constraint. It means we need to achieve the desired amplitude of the fundamental voltage component. And we would like to have one switching angle come after another one. So this leads to a nonlinear optimization problem, which can be solved relatively easily when you have a few angles, if you have dozens or maybe even 100 angles, it becomes a bit more time consuming and we need to apply a few tricks. So we solve this problem for each modulation index. So we would grid the range of modulation indices. And for each one, we would compute the set of optimal switching angles. And what you notice here is that this seamlessly extends from zero modulation to four over p. 4 over p is block mode. So that's the, the absolute maximum voltage any converter can synthesize. So you would switch up. Then you switch down till you're back at zero. So this is effectively your, your fundamental component. So you can synthesize a fundamental component with amplitude 1.27. Okay, so so this would be the extended linear range to 1.15, and this would be the nonlinear modulating regime. The OPP covers that all. It, it seamlessly extends from zero into block mode. That's, that's beautiful, beautiful. Now, there are difficulties arising when you use a linear controller. So first of all, a linear controller samples the converter current with regular sampling instances and it manipulates the modulation index. So that means it manipulates the amplitude of the modulating signal it applies. So that means it, want, it demands a little bit more or a little bit less. And that's highly problematic when you are at this point here, for example, where you have a, a discontinuity. So you make a small modification by your controller and you get a jump in the switching angle. And, and a huge disturbance in the volt segments. So this is not acceptable. So what people then do is they try to come up with smooth switching angles that avoid these jumps. But clearly that's suboptimal. Clearly the harmonic current distortions here will be increased. So you pay a price for that. The other aspect is that um, when you look at the ripple, the ripple in, in alpha and in beta with carrier based pulse width modulation is relatively large. But here at these points here, when your triangular carrier, and you remember what I showed you earlier, when these carrier signals are at the peak or at the bottom, if I sample at these points, I will sample exactly more or less just the fundamental component. The ripple component is zero. So, Controller doesn't see the switching. 
If I go for an optimized pulse pattern, the ripple is clearly much, much smaller in the currents, but there is no point at which the ripple in alpha and in beta would be zero. The ripple is always non-zero. So there is no moment in time where I could sample. Whenever I sample, I will get the fundamental component plus the ripple on top. Well, then people say I make the controller slow so that it doesn't react to that ripple. But then the disturbance rejection is poor, the response during transits is poor. So I want to now propose a controller that samples at regular time instances and the controller knows about the ripple. And it appreciates there is a current ripple and it doesn't need to be slowed down. And that brings us to model predictive pulse pattern control. The idea is very simple. So what you do is you, you start with your optimized pulse patterns. Let's say we have transformed it already in stationary orthogonal coordinates on alpha beta. And we integrate it up. We integrate it up from zero to the current time. We multiply it with half the DC link voltage. So this one here would be the theta voltage in alpha beta. Yeah, I should say integrate it up. And if I have an initial condition, then this is the state of flux. So this is the zigzag line. So I have here zero vectors. And this is sort of approximately a circle of the first quadrant. And this trajectory is optimal. This is the perfect trajectory for the state of flux. So even in the presence of disturbances, if I very tightly follows, follow the state of flux reference trajectory, then I will minimize my harmonic current distortions. And hence, I would like to track it. How can I track it? Well, I can manipulate the times when I switch. So assume you have a switching transition here from one to zero, and the nominal switching instant here is at this TA star. And if I now delay it a little bit, then I add a volt second contribution to phase A. And the volt second contribution is proportional by the time that I delay it times half the DC link voltage. So by doing that, by anticipating or delaying my switching instances, I can add or remove volt seconds. So I can directly manipulate the state of flux as it evolves. And based on that, I can formulate and solve a model predictive control problem in real time. So we want to track the, the perfect, the ideal, the, the reference state of flux trajectory. We do that in alpha beta. So let's say we have the state of flux reference here with the star and we have estimated our state of flux. And the difference between the two is an error in alpha beta we have now. And this error I can show you here. We are at current time step k and we work with discrete time steps. And this error is simply the state of flux error in alpha squared plus error in beta squared. Now we'd like to bring it down to make it close to zero at the end of the prediction horizon. N is the number of steps that I look forward. And whenever I have a switching transition, I can manipulate, I can change the state of flux error. So here I show you only phase A, but the same would apply to phase B and C. So in this case, I could, for example, delay a little bit switching. And here I anticipate a little bit switching. And by doing that, I bring it down and I bring it down. So when there's no switching, I can't do anything. I mean, I have no degree of freedom. I can only act when there's switching. So later, maybe we can have a bit of a discussion. If I really don't want to wait, I could add here a narrow pulse. And then the controller could use that new degree of freedom to already make these modifications now, and then to react immediately, and we wouldn't have to wait. So the predicted error at the end of the prediction horizon, simply the error we have now, plus all the corrections I'm, or minus all the corrections I'm going to make, depends on the DC link voltage, and it's a linear function of the switching instant modifications. So I can formulate 
a control problem that is linear in the switching instant modifications. So I want to make this predicted residual error at the end of the horizon small. So this is one term in my cost function. I penalize it quadratically. And I also want to minimize the degree by which I have to manipulate the switching instances. So this delta t is a big vector of all the um, switching instant modifications. So delta ta1, delta ta2, and the same phase b and phase c. Now, if I have such a switching transition in phase a, I must not move it into the past because that would be a causal. I can only go to the current time step. And I must not move it beyond the next switching transition. Because if I did that, so if I shifted it till here, then I would first switch up and then I would switch down. So I would produce a switch position two, which is not acceptable for a three level converter. So I get these constraints, linear constraints in phase A, B, and C that tell me that the switching instances are constrained between the current time step and the next one. But they're not constrained between the phases. So what I can do is I can move the switching instant here, for example. And by doing that, I create a new voltage vector that has previously not existed. Yeah? That's nice. So this is a so-called quadratic program. The cost function is quadratic in the delta t's. The constraints are linear in the delta t's. So I can solve that relatively easily. Or I can say I set this q to 0. Then this term disappears, and I have a deadbeat controller. I make this horizon n as short as possible. So I would like to have at least one switching transition per phase. So I would pick this one here as a horizon. And then I can do model inversion and I can very easily compute the switching instant modifications. So this is nicely running in the lab, in the medium voltage lab. So you have here two mega volt ampere asynchronous machine. You have the converter here. So relatively thick cables. And you see here steady state operation. You see the, the currents in phase A, B, and C. I mean, the, perfect at something like 200 amps, but at 3.3 kilovolts machine. Well, we at half speed, so we would have 1.6 kilovolts um, machine voltage. And you see here the currents um, when we switch between model predictive pulse pattern control and direct torque control. And this point here is zoomed in a little bit down here, so you can see it a bit better. So here we switch. And you see how the current ripple increases with DTC. Well, DTC actually uses a higher switching frequency than MP3C. So with MP3C, we bring down the harmonic current distortions by 50%, roughly, compared to direct torque control. And we also operate at a lower switching frequency. So we achieve machine-friendly operation and inverter-friendly operation at the same time. And we get a bit higher higher power. Why do these higher, why do these lower harmonic distortions help us? So we have seen also when we compare to space vector modulation that we can bring down the current distortions by maybe 40%, 50% or the switching frequency. But harmonic distortions, they don't really have much of a tangible value. What really has value is power, the power you can sell your, your converter at. So if you look at low, motor frequencies. And you compare it with space vector modulation with MP3C with this optimized pulse patterns, we can operate more deeply in the nonlinear modulation regime. So we get more voltage and hence we get more power. Now, if you go up in, in, in motor frequency, you need to maintain a certain pulse number. Let's say you want to maintain pulse number five as you go up in the fundamental frequency. So that means your switching frequency starts increasing. So if I show you here the, the switching frequency, it'd be constant, and here it would be going up. 
Higher switching frequency means more losses in the semiconductors, means they're getting hotter, you're thermally limited, so you have to start reducing your current. So you bring your current down, that means you bring your power down, and that's called derating. And that's painful, that's that substantial derating as your fundamental frequency goes up. With MP3C, because we can operate at lower pulse numbers and get the same harmonic distortions, this derating starts later. Maybe we can operate here at pulse number three. And then the derating is less brutal. So we get all this additional power. And this additional power is effectively money. I mean, we can sell the same drive for more money. So this is really a cost reduction or a margin increase. And that has a huge economical value, whereas current distortions have virtually no economical value. So you need to make this some um, translation. You need to translate this nice quantity into something tangible that is interested from a, from a business point of view. In terms of torque dynamics, it's effectively the same. So the time it takes to run down the torque is the same with DTC and MP3C. So we get a similar dynamic performance. So to wrap that up, advantages are we get very low harmonic distortions. We can shape the harmonic spectrum. We get very nice, very fast dynamic response. But because we have pre-computed these optimized pulse patterns offline, they're sort of static. So if I now have voltage steps that are non-uniform, or I have an unbalanced load, or I have strong grid harmonics, or I have additional control objectives, then things are a bit more difficult because they're inflexible. MP3C is conceptually relatively difficult. It's, it's not so easy to design and to get running. Computing OPPs can be time consuming. And the switching frequency um, is uh, chosen synchronously with the fundamental frequency. So you lose here a lot of possible switching frequency you could use. Now with this, I would like to move on to the last point. That will take five minutes, and then I will have two minutes to, to wrap up, and then we can have a discussion and, and look into questions. So the last topic are load commutated inverter drives, LCIs. Um, consider here a, a transformer, 12 piles, two rectifiers in parallel with the firing angles alpha. It's a current source inverter, so we have a choke in the DC link rather than a capacitor. You have the inverter driving a large synchronous machine, which is externally excited with field windings, driving here the load. So you would have here the, the big, I believe here's the big synchronous machine. So the model is very, very simple. Effectively, the, the DC link current changes whenever you change the voltage at these two points. So you take the line side voltage and you translate it through the rectifier and the same with the machine voltage. And the torque is simply the, the DC link current times cosine, the firing angle. We would like to regulate the torque along its reference. We would like to keep the, the DC link current along its reference. And we do that by manipulating the firing angles. The thyristor bridge is alpha for the rectifier and beta for the inverter. We have constraints to meet, so the DC link current must not get too high, else we have a trip. And the firing angles are limited to avoid commutation failures. Effectively, that we ask the converter to, to commutate, but we are too close to where it can't commutate anymore, and then we get a, a, a large current spike, and most likely we will have to trip. So what we do is we formulate a quadratic cost function over a relatively short horizon including the, the quantities of concern. The model is nonlinear, but we can linearize it. We have the constraints that gives us a quadratic program, which we can solve quickly and efficiently on yeah, a reasonably powerful dual core power PC. And then we can run this. So we are particularly interested in low voltage right through. So here's the grid voltage. This is a low voltage test stand. So we have the grid voltage collapse. That means the diesel link current collapses, the mechanical speed and the torque collapse. 
you hear the grid voltage comes back after 200 milliseconds, but then the controller overreacts and we have a trip here because it can't keep it below an upper limit. Now you say the controller is too aggressive and you're right, but you want it to be aggressive because at steady state, you want to reject the disturbances. So truth to be told, this controller is not suitable to operate for lower um, voltages. Now, if you use MPC, you can very nicely write through because the controller knows about the current constraint, keep the current below, and then write through. And this is running in, in Norway. Norway exports a lot of oil and gas, and these scripts are extremely costly. I mean, a, a trip costs half a million dollars in lost production per hour. And here I have an example where we actually have measured such a low voltage right through scenario where the grid collapses to 35%. And then it recovers and you see here that the, the compressor nicely right through. Hmm? So it doesn't trip with force power. So we get this improved low voltage right through and we can also reduce the reactive power demand. Now, let me wrap up. So what you see is when you go to IEEE Explore and you put as a search string predictive and control and inverter or converter in the abstract, you see that you get this exponential growth in the number of new publications a year. So effectively, the number of new publications doubles every three years from the year 2000 onwards. So every three years, we have twice as many as we had before. Last slide, commercial benefits of MPC. MPC I would say it's the minimization of the cost. So we can get more power out for the same hardware. We get better performance during transients and faults. I mean, you need control for transients and faults, not for steady state. We can keep our quantities of interest within the safe operating area, as shown with the LCI, and it's much easier to design and to adapt and to tune. Challenges are one needs to build up a lot of know-how, a lot of know-how outside of R&D, in sales, in the field engineers, in the whole organization. So this takes many, many, many years. And to facilitate that, the method should be as simple as possible, and it must be applicable to the whole range of products. So if you have a method that works well for a niche application, but not for all other applications, it will be very difficult. You need to have a method that really excels for all applications. So asynchronous machines, synchronous machines with external field widening, with permanent magnet, with strong saliency, grid connected converters, two level, three level, five level, MMCs. You need to have it for the whole range. An assessment, MPC in power electronics has really grown a lot. There's, there's significant interest in the academic community. For industry, it's a potential differentiator and a cost saver, so industry is getting interested. But to get them interested, you need to yeah, provide them with something tangible, and industry is interested in, in money. I mean, they want to it improve their competitiveness and reduce cost. So you probably, one probably has to look beyond methods that are overly simplistic and look at methods that really give you a quantifiable, tangible performance and monetary benefit. So I would say what we see today is just the tip of the iceberg. So I use that as an, as an encouragement to people who have just started exploring. I think we are still at a fairly early stage. I think there's a lot to be done and there's a lot to be explored. So with this, I would like to conclude. I would like to thank you for your attention, for bearing with me. And if you want to read up on some of the more detailed topics, there's a little book you could have a look at from, from 2016. So, Thank you very much. I'm happy to now answer some of your questions you might have. Hello, this is Koshik here. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 
Hi, uh, excellent presentation. Very nice, learned a lot of things. I have a few questions. So uh, one is that at the beginning, when you were uh, explaining uh, that M FCS MPC, right? You showed a comparison in uh, uh, related to the the di the speed of the dynamic response, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I forgot which slide it was. It was uh, towards the beginning, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, you you compared uh, space vector PWM, right? So I am wondering that uh, when you are comparing the speed with the space vector modulation, uh, so. There must be, it should be related to a current controller bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, so the, what is the bandwidth? So the bandwidth, it depends upon the bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. So when you are comparing, so how you choose the best bandwidth so that, you know, you get the best performance out of your SVPWM. I mean, your bandwidth is really limited effectively by by stability margin. So if you make your controller too aggressive in the presence of a delay and the delay you get because you have a delay between your controller and your modulator. So you get this small delay here and you have maybe a delay while well, it, because it takes time to compute things. This delay really limits your bandwidth. Okay. Uh, right. So, right, right, right. So I, I was just wondering that uh, if I don't have this uh, slide number to tell you where you did the comparison of the dynamic response. So, okay. But of course, yes, 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 that is true. So, uh, so one uh, question that uh, I'm sorry. So, Oh, uh, one one question is that it looked like from the presentation, right? This, these two important questions while designing a FCS MPC based controller is that one is uh, designing, I'm sorry, one is uh, designing your, how to choose the sampling time, right? Given that, you know, you have a restriction on the effective switching frequency or whatever you say, the pulse number, right? Finally, that is coming from your constraint from your design converter, right? And also, uh, also how you choose uh, the the uh, horizon, right? I mean, you have shown numerically. Yeah. Yes, uh, there is a case where if you increase the time horizon, you know, you get a better THD per same switching frequency, right? So, but but uh, but the thing is that you know, if I choose, say, it's a three-level inverter, how one will go about? Uh, finding that what should be the sampling frequency and what should be the n or the horizon, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Maybe we can have a quick look. I mean, the, the sampling frequency should be in the range of 100 times the switching frequency. So then you are okay. Right. But so isn't your that, uh, length of your horizon, you can make it relatively short if you have a simple system. I mean, if you just have a, an RL load or an induction machine, you don't need a horizon of 10. Maybe one or two or three steps is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing is that uh, when you say the, you know, uh, if it is a relatively low frequency, right? Like, if you talk about uh, its switching frequencies in one or two kilohertz, then the sampling uh, could be in hundred kilohertz and which like, you know, our real time controllers, like say uh, MCU from TI or something is capable of doing the calculations in real time. But if you go to a little higher frequency, like if your switching frequencies, the mother, say that like it's a grid type inverter application, where you know the switching frequency can be at 20, 30, you know, in the ballpark of 50 kilohertz. So in that case, um, it becomes difficult, right? I mean, your computation has to happen at a much faster rate, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And for grid connected converters, I, th I think I'm, I'm a bit ambivalent what I would propose. Um, I'm not so strongly convinced that the finite control set MPC is that suitable for grid connected converters. 
Right. Because why do you go up with switching frequency? I think you go up because you want to remove as much harmonic content as possible because you want right. to meet the grid codes. Right. But with finite control set MPC, it's difficult to meet the grid codes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had your slide, which I somehow can't. Right, right. Unhide. Right. I mean, there are ways to. Okay. But let, let me see. I mean, you can try to. Here. So you can try to control the harmonic spectrum. So if you say this is my uncontrolled spectrum and this, these are the grid codes, the, the, the limits, I can try to control the amplitudes of my harmonics with a new approach and try to bring them below my grid code limits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, this is really in its infancy, so it's not I mean, right. it's a new result. Hmm. Direction, yeah. I think, oh. I think yeah. when you're grid connected, I would I would really go more for something deterministic, you know. I mean, here is this OP optimized pulse pattern. We can really compute OPPs that really nicely meet the grid code limits. So uh, one mm -hmm. question about this OPP is, right, like, uh, see, you already know the angles pre-computed, right, like in SHE, right? Mm -hmm. And then what you are doing is uh, by looking at the disturbance, you are always calculating, right? You are calculating at a much faster rate. You can, it, you are almost in a continuum, uh, like uh, with respect to your line cycle, right? So when you end up, say, when you hit your first angle, you sort of know that, you know what, uh, how to manipulate that, right? But mm -hmm. only within a limit, right? Mm -hmm. And that also means that you, in your dynamic response, right? Like if you are, if you have to, you know, uh, get passed through a disturbance, which is happening in few milliseconds, right? So say suddenly the current is shooting up and you need to bring it down. You need to do something about it, right? Through your control. But then the action that you can take only when you know your first angle comes up, say at thirty degrees, right? So, um, so is it not that we allow to insert pulses during large disturbances or transients? So we would okay. say if, okay. if my arrow becomes excessive, mm -hmm. then I would allow that I insert here a suitable pulse. Mm -hmm. Give me here this degree of freedom, and then I can bring this down almost instantaneously. I right. don't have to wait. Right. So, so, but, but this has implications in right, uh, like you're dynamically you are increasing the losses in the devices, right, compared to its steady state design. But this is what we always do. I mean, switching frequency is not defined during a transient, because many other switching transitions you would not do during a transient. Right, but but it might happen, right? For uh, these uh, like high current devices, that your um, your the junction temperature may rise by that time, right? Significantly, if you have a localized uh, high frequency switching happening, right? Yeah, but it's one transition that you really add. I mean, you have to be careful that you don't add lots of them. That would be bad. But one or two is okay. Right. So one question I always have, like, you know, how you uh, define uh, the bandwidth in a controller like this, how you measure the speed, right? I mean, what is the definition of uh, measuring speed in the uh, presence of a disturbance rejection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would, you would effectively, I mean, bandwidth is, it's effectively the, Right. The inverse of the time it takes to get to, I think, 66% of the response. Right. I mean, you would say that the in classical, in a classical sense. Yeah. That's time, and you have a step from zero to one, and it would react like this. I think you would somehow measure the slope here. Right. 
and this would give you a time and the inverse of the time is the frequency yeah. and that would be sort of the time with. Right, right. What's okay. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks for the good questions. Thank you. Sir, uh, I want to ask one question uh, related to formulation of the cost function. So in that we have this quadratic error between the predicted and uh, the reference uh, state variable plus the square of the control, right? Yeah, yeah. So in that, sir, uh, can that control uh, inputs uh, space, uh, can it be between zero to one, like a duty ratio, which is a continuous variable, uh, which mm -hmm. can reduce the number of, uh, I mean, it could be a continuous function as well, right? Rather than a switching uh, variable. Yes. And this problem is much easier to solve. You can make it effectively a modulating signal or yes. But, but then you, you're looking at a different problem. You would go for, so you would effectively have here a controller and you would keep the modulator. Okay. So some people call it continuous control set MPC. Okay. So this is a real valued quantity, but it's bounded. It's bounded between, let's say, minus one and one. It's much easier to solve. You typically end up with a quadratic program, which is conceptually much easier, easier than these integer programs you have here. Uh, people feel that here you go for horizon one and you do enumeration, which is trivial. And the QP is then much more complicated than horizon one here. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, one more thing, uh, how to, uh, uh, I think you addressed this uh, point already, but uh, I just want to know uh, what is the standard procedure of tuning uh, the weights uh, in the cost function in order to get the optimal. Yeah, usually people use trial and error. I, I don't think the trial and error method is so good. Um, I mean, if, if you control the currents and you want to limit the switching frequency, you just, like the cost function I showed you, you just have this, this penalty on switching. This needs tuning, but you can also just say, I, I keep track of my switching frequency and I add a term in my cost function. I say, I have a switching frequency reference minus the switching frequency I, I observe. And this one I want to make small. And then I have a model for my switching frequency, which is effectively, <coughs> which is effectively your switching going in and then sort of a low pass filter. And that gives you your switching frequency. So this would be a dynamical model with which you augment your state space. Okay. Uh, that means in this case, the switching frequency uh, cannot be maintained constant. No, no, you would. You would control your switching frequency okay. to the desired level. Okay. And there would okay. be no tuning. So the tuning is gone. Okay. Okay. Um, I would have to find a paper, but this one here would mention it. Mm, no. This one here would mention it. Um, it's a paper with um, Bartolomeo Stellato. He was the first author. Bart Bartolomeo Bartolomeo Stellato. He's a extremely bright person. So he, he did that in a paper. I can try to find it later and maybe put it in the chat. Uh, and uh, uh, most of the questions that uh, I have in my mind, uh, I mean, uh, and they got uh, clarified because of your presentation. So thank you very much. No, that's good. Thanks for thanks for attending. So I, this is the paper. I put it in the chat that proposes to, yeah, to effectively include the switching frequency in the state space model, and then to have a term in the cost function that forces it along. So I have one question. So how will you take care about the uncertainty in the model parameter? 
look i think people are usually very much concerned about it that their model is wrong i have I have not really encountered this issue so much that the model is wrong. I've, I've not, okay. you know, I've not struggled so much with it. I mean, I can maybe give you two or three examples. I mean, here with this model predictive pulse pattern control, there is effectively no model we control. <laughs> we control the state of flux along its trajectory. And this is the model. The model is an integrator, so the model is correct. So there is no, no model uncertainty. So now if, if you do it for grid connected converters, then you need to know a little bit about the grid. Fair enough. But for a machine, there is no model. Now, if you go to the last one, the LCI, Here it's effectively the DC link choke, which you know unless it really saturates. So again, you know the model. Now, if you go to finite control set and PC, then yes, there is a model. Yes. So here one has to be a little bit careful how one formulates it. And that's why I proposed this slide here that you effectively control the torque and the flux, but you want to make sure that your level set, that your cost function is such that, that you effectively minimize your current THD. So this is explained in this paper here. So if you control torque and flux, you compensate for the wrong torque. So your controller compensates for the wrong torque, but you still get the harmonic performance of a current controller then I feel it's less critical to have exactly the correct parameters. And uh, I have one more question that uh, when you were talking about that uh, advantage of APC covered that conventional current control or conventional control, see one of the thing that you mentioned that uh, basically that uh, 3TS by 2, that delay really matters actually in achieving higher bandwidth in conventional control, whereas in MPC, this can be reduced. But one thing that you are also uh, computing in one some uh, loop, right? Which is running in some uh, ISR service routing, interrupt, interrupt service routing. So that delay also is there actually in this. So how will you compare that delay with this conventional current control? Yeah, I might not have fully understood your question. I think there are two delays. I mean, there's one delay imposed by having a separate modulator. Right. This one can avoid by doing it in one stage. The other delay is that it takes time to compute things. <laughs> so this we still have, but this we also had earlier on. And to compensate for this computational delay, one can do a compensation step that looks like this. So you say that I want to apply a new switch position, for example, at time step k. What you do is you measure things at time step k minus one, and you use the previously applied switch position that you had applied here, and you use your model to predict what will the states actually look like at time step k using your model. So you do a mapping you are mapping from, from, oh, from here to here. And you start communicating to your central processor, you compute, and then you communicate down to your power converter, but you base it on, on the predicted states that you think you would measure at the time when you will apply the new control input. So here in this first step, you do this delay compensation before you start computing things. But you need to have a reasonably accurate model, but, but you can map it one step forward. Thank you so much, sir. It was an insightful session. I'd like uh, now Dr. Deepa, the secretary of IEEE Bangalore chapter, to give the vote of thanks on behalf of uh, IEEE Power Electronics Society student branch chapter 
you are as in college of engineering good evening am i audible yes ma'am thank you pa good evening all i am dr k deepa secretary ieee pls bangalore chapter and it's a great pleasure in delivering vote of thanks i thank dr tobias jair for having accepted our invitation to deliver this webinar on model predictive control in power electronics a critical review sir this was a technical feast for all the researchers in drives you have started from the basics of predictive control and you have taken us through the design analysis of drive systems with mpc i would like to extend my thanks to dr vinod kumar advisor ieee pels of new horizon college for having arranged this webinar or dlp thank you sir i also take this opportunity to thank the management of new horizon college of engineering and triple e department hod and the faculty members of triple e for providing all the support for the smooth conduct of the dlp my special thanks to mr vishal chair of ieee pels bangalore chapter and dr kaushik basu past chair of ieee pels bangalore chapter for their constant support and encouragement for all the events organized under ieee pels bangalore chapter banner last but not the least i thank all the exico members of pels bangalore chapter and ieee pels new horizon college of engineering student branch student members for the smooth conduct of the dlp i thank all the participants for attending the webinar and for actively taking part in the webinar q and a session thank you all looking forward to meet you all in the next event thank you thank you ma'am thank you for the kind words and was really a pleasure to talk to you i i only have one regret that i couldn't be there physically but yeah maybe in the next uh, year maybe in future years. we will definitely have a dlp next year offline sir yes yes no, that would be much better no but thanks for your kind words and thanks for having dialed in thank you <laughs>